Pass that to the center aisle. We'll collect that at the conclusion of our service so that we may have a record of your visit with us today. We do meet every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for morning worship, 6 o'clock on Sunday evening, 7 on Wednesdays for our midweek Bible study. Our song leader today, as usual, is Brother John McDaniel. He selected number 435. 435 is our first song. If you wish to grab a songbook and turn to that number or watch the screen above me at the appropriate time. Brother Chad Dollahite will bring us the message of the hour. Ricky Spake will lead our minds in prayer at the appropriate time. And Scott Williams will conclude our service in prayer this morning. Concerning those on our prayer list, <coughs> Wanda Young, the aunt of Josh and Chloe Chapman, has been moved to the Atlanta Medical Center, and now she's scheduled to have surgery on Tuesday. She has yet to have surgery just yet, but the uh, latest information we have is she is scheduled to have surgery Tuesday morning. Ruth Tuggle fell yesterday and is at home recovering. You're asked to remember her at this time. You're also asked to continue to remember Helen Head, Florine King, who continues her recovery at home, and Sister Bill Yu, as she continues at the Oaks Assisted Living Facility in Carrollton. Also, Marlene's caregiver, Karen, has had the flu and has not been feeling well. Are there others that we should mention? <clears throat> if you're graduating from high school or college, please send a picture with your school information to Joyce as soon as possible. For those graduating from either high school or college, Please provide picture and the information accompanying that to Joyce as early as possible. Other activities I want to bring to your, bench, your uh, attention. Group 3 will meet this Saturday, April the 20th at Jake and Julie's house. This is Jake and Julie's uh, group. Group 3 will meet this coming Saturday, April the 20th, 6 p.m. Group 1, Adam and Carrie's group, will meet Sunday night, which is next Sunday, April the 21st. After the evening worship service and the fellowship hall pizza party, there's a sign-up list in the foyer. Our gospel meeting is rapidly approaching. It begins the last Sunday of this month, April the 28th, goes through Thursday, May the 2nd. We've assigned that uh, Sunday as our goal attendance day. We're hopeful of having 250 in attendance, which we feel is certainly within our grasp. Our attendance numbers of late have been hovering just below 200, so we're hopeful that we can exceed that and reach our goal of attending 250 that morning. We'll have a potluck after the morning worship service as we typically do on gospel meetings. Groups, uh, Brothers Keepers groups one and two were asked to set up tea and coffee and groups three and four will be asked to clean up. But again, that gospel meeting is rapidly approaching. We have some flyers available for those who wish to help us promote that. And we would ask you to invite your friends and family and neighbors to our gospel meeting upcoming very soon. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, our Youth Day will be here at Bremen, Saturday, May the 4th, beginning at around 9 o'clock, I suppose, Johnny. Brandon Britton will be the speaker from the Forest Park Congregation in Valdosta. If you've not ever heard Brother Brandon, you're certainly in for a treat, and he will do an excellent job for sure. The next area-wide singing is this coming Friday. I beg your pardon, Friday, April the 26th. Friday, April the 26th at the West Georgia Congregation. Two other brief announcements, and I don't see her in attendance this morning, so I think I'm safe in making this surprise announcement. We are hope looking forward to having a surprise 80th birthday party for Sister Barbara Cron next Sunday. Next Sunday after the morning service, for those who wish to stick around after that, her son Chris is having a catered meal. For those who wish to participate in that, please let Joyce know at your earliest convenience today if possible. Also, to keep you up to speed as to what's happening concerning Christians for Science, Brother Bob Staples, that we've had to come and speak to us before concerning his efforts to identify evolution being taught as a fact in the government schools. There is a rally planned for Monday, April the 29th, beginning at 10 o'clock on the steps of the Georgia State Capitol. We're trying to put logistics con together concerning that event. Once we get more information, we'll certainly make that known to you. But block that date if you have the availability to participate in this event. The more folks there at that meeting, the better. Would you bow with me, please? 
Kind and gracious Father, we're grateful for the many blessings of life. We're thankful that you spared our lives to this hour, that we have the opportunity to worship thee in spirit and in truth. Father, may we have come for no other purpose to do just that. Forgive us when we fail thee, Father. May we stand pure and clean in thy sight and focus on our energies here today, that you'll be happy with our worship and we'll edify one another as a result. Father, we're prayerful for those who have a public part in leading us in our worship today. May they have prepared themselves in such a way that they may lead us in a song, lead us in a prayer, present to those things to us that are most needful for us at this time. Father, continue to watch over and care for us. For this is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship now and stand and sing number 435. As I travel through this pilgrim, my there is a friend who walks with me. Supper this morning, number 151. 151.
pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for that cross. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Jesus who went to that cross on each one of our behalves. Our Heavenly Father, we're so sorry for our sin that put him on that cross. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we use the scripture to go back and learn what our Savior truly did for each one of us on that cross, the agony he suffered for each one of us. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this bread. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that we, our minds reflect on this bread which represents Jesus' body that was slain on each one of our behalves. We pray all this through Jesus' name. Amen. Do we miss anyone in our serving? Let's continue our prayer. Like man, and Father, we thank thee for this fruit of thine which represents us Christians, that shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf. As we're about to partake of it, may we do so in a manner well pleased in thy sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Did we miss anyone serving the fruit of God? This concludes the Lord's Supper. We now have a privilege and a commandment to give back to God as we've been prospered. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the blessings that you give to us. Our Heavenly Father, we would never be able to sit down and write them and count them out loud. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we give back to you as we've been prospered. We pray that we're good stewards over everything that you give to us. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you bless this money and that this money will go to further your kingdom. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Number 706, 706. Sing me a song about Jesus.
177. 177. In verses 1 and 3. 1 and 3 before our prayer this morning. Pure in heart, O oh God, help me to be. May I devote my life wholly to Thee. Watch Thou. to come to thee in prayer. We're thankful for this day. We're thankful that we can be out here this morning to further worship you. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for every blessing that you bless us with every day of our lives. We could never count all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We're thankful, Heavenly Father, that you loved us enough to send your only begotten Son into this world to live among men and to finally go to the cross for our sins. Heavenly Father, we pray that we might live our lives every day in view, in view of eternity, that one day we will answer for our deeds. Pray, that, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to be with this church and bless it. We're thankful for our leadership. We pray that you'll continue to bless them with wisdom. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will bless us as followers, that we will uh, live good lives daily and, and be good, good examples to other people around us. We also ask, Heavenly Father, that you might forgive us of our sins and our trespasses. We pray that you will help us to listen attentively to the message today from Brother Chad that we will make an application in our lives. Pray that you will continue to be with us through the remainder of our lives. Pray that uh, that you will continue to bless us with the things that we need. We ask all these things now, Heavenly Father, in your Son's name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The invitation song this morning will be number eight. Number eight. And before the lesson, we'll sing 699. 699. Let's stand for the song before the lesson. We'll sing verses 1 and 4. And then Brother Chad will speak to us. Let's sing out together. Hold out those hold hands. Lean on the mighty power of Jesus.
So good to be here this morning, and good to see everyone as well. We have been talking for several weeks about Bible authority. We're going to continue that this morning, looking at another aspect of authority, and just as we did last week, notice what we've looked at thus far. We have defined authority. Authority is someone who has the right to command, and, and in which case others have the obligation to obey. We've seen that God has given all authority to Jesus, and then Jesus turned and gave authority to his apostles. That's why the things that they write are the commandments of the Lord. The Spirit inspired the scriptures, 2 Timothy 3.16, and also into verse 17 there. <clears throat> and today, Jesus authorizes by means of the New Testament, the, the last will and testament, we might call it, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and that's what he left for us to follow here on this earth. And then last week, we noticed that sometimes God authorizes by means of direct statements and commands. Sometimes people use the expression, don't just tell me, show me. We, I've heard the expression many times in, in relation to children that children learn more from what is caught than from what is taught. They learn more from the example that they see, or at least, I think it would at least, at the very least, be fair to say they learn as much from the example they see as from what they are directly taught by mom and dad and, and others as well. And so we're talking, of course, about example. Direct statements are not the only way God authorizes. He also authorizes by means of an example. And I want us to just break it down into uh, three different categories here and notice these, and, and then the lesson will be yours. Let's notice, first of all, examples that we ought not to follow. It seems obvious and, and fair that we should talk about some examples that we ought not follow. Any example that doesn't have the approval of Christ or the apostles obviously ought not to be followed. The, now, when we say Jesus, we talk about an example not having the approval of Jesus ought not to be followed, and that's obvious because he has all authority in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28, 18, but also because he's king of kings, lord of lords, 1 Timothy 6, 15 says, in fact, the blessed and only potentate, Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We, won't, we don't want to follow anything that doesn't have the approval of the apostles because they are the ambassadors of Christ. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5, 20, Paul says, as though God did beseech you by us. Paul says, us being the apostles, we pray you in Christ's stead, be you reconciled to God. You know, when an ambassador for the United States speaks, it carries with it all the authority, and it is as if our government were speaking itself. And so when an ambassador for Christ, one of the apostles, sp spoke, or speaks today even through the written word, it is as authoritative as if Jesus Christ himself were standing here and giving that command. So we don't want to do anything that doesn't have the approval of Christ or the apostles. And the simple thought here is just simply that when, when the New Testament records someone who made a mistake, who erred, then that is an example that we want to avoid. We want to stay away from that. And that just got, kind of goes without saying, but it, it does fall into this category of examples. Turn in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and you'll see this principle illustrated here. <clears throat> Paul is, is sort of setting it all up in the first couple of verses and, and, and says that he doesn't want the brethren to be ignorant about how the fathers were under the cloud and they passed through the sea and <clears throat> they were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But, verse 5, with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our, there's our word, examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore him that thinketh he standeth, let him that thinketh he standeth 
take heed lest he fall. Well, there's our principle. Here, here Paul says these things are happening for an example, obviously not an example that Paul's saying, hey, look, here, do just like they did. It's an example that we ought not follow. Some other examples might include Acts 5, 1 through 11, Ananias and Sapphira. We used to say sometimes in the pew packers class, when I've, I've taught pew packers classes before, and uh, I'd, I'd tell the kids, if you have trouble, remember, just remember that Ananias and Sapphira, they lied and they died. <laughs> and, so, and that's exactly what happened. They lied about how much money they gave to the church. It wasn't that they didn't give all the money to the church. The money was theirs to do with as they pleased. But it was that they lied about how much they gave. Oh, yes, we gave it all. They wanted this big recognition from the church for giving all of the money from that purchase to the church. But the problem was they didn't give all the money. And so they fell dead because of that. That's obviously an example to teach us that we need to be careful and teach us not to be uh, dishonest. Acts 8, 18 to 23, Simon the sorcerer has obeyed the gospel. He's a Christian, and, and he sees that Peter has this amazing power to confer the ability to do miracles onto other people. And he says, I want this power also. He says, he offered them money, the text says. Give me, give me this ability to pass on the miraculous. And, of course, Peter tells him, says, uh, you, have, you don't have either part nor lot in this matter. Your heart's not right in the sight of God. You need to repent and pray. Perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Well, there's an example of somebody, again, dealing with money, as so often is the case, but he, he says, your heart's not right in the sight of God. This is not an example for us to follow. It's a warning, a cautionary tale, we might say. Galatians 2, 11 to 13, Peter gets caught up in prejudice, uh, sort of a, 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 we might even call it in the realm of racism, Jew and Gentile. And he get, Peter gets caught up in that, and even Barnabas gets carried away with their dissimulation, Paul says. And, and Paul withstood Peter to the face and rebuked him because he got caught up in all that. Well, that's an example even from the life of an apostle that we don't want to follow because he was wrong. And Paul says, I withstood him to the face. Why, Paul? Because he was to be blamed. All these are examples that we ought not follow. Let's talk second about examples that we have the option of following. Examples that we have the option of following. When we have an approved example, sometimes there are one of several options that are available. In other words, we know for one thing that an approved example is obviously authorized today. If you see an example in Scripture that is approved, it meets with God's approval, with God's commendation, that obviously is something that is authorized. But some examples present an option of how to follow a command of God. For example, Acts 2.46, the church met daily in the temple. Acts 542 also mentions daily, the idea that the church is meeting daily. But that's not always the case. Acts 20, verses 6 and 7, Paul comes to Troas and he abides there six days. He's going to meet with the church. There are other occasions where it's not indicated that the church met every single day. So that's an optional matter. Would it be okay if the church were to meet every single day? Well, sure, we've got an approved example of that in Scripture. But it's not something that is mandatory. Acts 8, 30 and 31, and, and, and some of this we're moving through quickly, and I realize that, but it's for time's sake, and I want to make sure we get through it. And, of course, uh, I, I, I haven't said this in this study up to this point, but I want to say it now, and, and hopefully I'll remember to say it again. Uh, any of this, I know sometimes, especially on Sunday morning, we try as, as well. I try, I try desperately. I don't always succeed, but I try to get it in because of, if nothing else, but because of the radio spot to, to try to get this, uh, get the sermon in by 11 o'clock. But if... For some reason, because of moving quickly through something, you say, well, I just don't understand that, or I wish he'd expanded further on this, or given more detail about that, then we always have the question box back there, and you, you're uh, welcome to submit that, and I will get to it as quick as I can. So keep that in mind. But Acts 8, 30 and 31, Philip and what we often refer to as the Ethiopian eunuch, they're on the road, and they engage in a Bible study on the road. They're traveling in this chariot. Well, they have a Bible study on the road. Is that the only way? Well, obviously it's not. We have several examples. Acts 3, verses 1 and following. Peter and John are teaching at the temple. So we know that's an option. You have Acts 10, verses 27 and following. Peter travels to Cornelius' house and has an in-home Bible study. One of the first in-home Bible studies. Well, that's obviously an option. Acts 16, 13 and following. Paul, Luke, and others taught there at the riverside. You may be on the fishing bank. Uh, maybe on the riverbank fishing or on the lake shore 
fishing and having a Bible study or maybe just a Bible discussion. Well, is that authorized? Certainly. That's an option of how to do it. Acts 26, verses 1 and following. Paul taught Agrippa, and that's a courtroom scene. Well, they're in court. See, again, you see these are all options. The, the command is go preach the gospel. Well, these are options as far as examples that are set for us. Acts 11, 27 to 30, Paul and Barnabas carried this contribution that was being taken to the brethren. Well, is that the only way to carry a contribution? It must it always be carried by two? Well, common sense would tell us that, the answer to that. But if that didn't do it, then we have examples in Philippians 2, 25, where Epaphroditus was sent. And that's just one person. Then you've got uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 17, where it mentions there Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. Well, you've got three men there. Again, these are optional matters. If we could send a contribution by one person, we could send it by two, we could send it by a handful of people. It wouldn't matter. These are, these are examples that are optional. Acts 19, 8 through 10. Uh, Paul has a setting there, a school-type setting, where there's edification, there's evangelism going on. Well, is that the only way to do it in a school-type setting? It certainly isn't. Acts 20, verse 7, Paul mentions there specifically that he taught the brethren publicly from house to house. Acts 18, 26, Aquila and Priscilla, they took this man named Apollos aside and they taught him privately. So there's private teaching, public teaching. And then in Acts 15, verses 22 and following, the Jerusalem church sends a letter to the Gentile brethren instructing them. So by means of a letter. We got public, got private, a letter. That would include in our day and age internet, phone call. You see, these are optional. These are examples that we have the option of following to fulfill a command. Could I write somebody a letter and teach them the gospel? Sure. But could I also send them an email? Well, sure. You get the idea. These are examples that we have the option of following. There's no one way that we must carry that command out. It's not, there's not some binding way there. Um, two others that I was going to mention, I didn't know if we'd have time to, so I didn't necessarily put them on the handout. Um, an example, let me get the reference right, Acts 16, 1 to 3, where Paul mentions he took Timothy and, and had him circumcised. And then Galatians 2, 3 and Galatians 5, 2 to 4, Paul very much specifically says there uh, that he mentions in one occasion that Titus wasn't compelled to be circumcised in Galatians 2. Galatians 5, 2 to 4, he says if you're trying to keep circumcision and being justified by the law, you're falling from grace. And sometimes people say, well, is that a contradiction? You have two different examples there. You have in the one example, Paul takes a young man and says, well, you know, you need to be circumcised. Another example where he says no. So which one is right? Well, they both are. It's different circumstances. It's optional. There may be a certain circumstance where Paul felt like he could reach out to those brethren. And so he did. He, he acquiesced, we might say, in order to try to reach out to some of those brethren. But then there are other situations where Paul says these Judaizers, they're binding it and they're saying you, you've got to be circumcised as part of a religious rite and as part of being able to go to heaven. And Paul says, I'm not standing for that because the gospel of Christ is sufficient. If he felt like he could reach out to somebody and help to open them up to receive the gospel, then he would do that. But he says he's not going to compromise on the gospel of Christ. And so when it came down to keeping something as a matter of a doctrinal matter, he said, no, I'm not going to do that. So you see, both examples there, we have an option of following depending on the situation. Another example that came to my mind was Acts 18, verses 1 to 3. Well, is it sinful to be paid to preach? Well, certainly it's not. There's 1 Corinthians 9, 6 to 14, when uh, one of my instructors taught us this in preacher school, he gave us the topic for the heading, uh, I mean the topic as a heading for that section of pas the passage of 1 Corinthians 9, pay the preacher, that was what he called it. But uh, that's what he's saying there in 1 Corinthians 9, 6 to 14, is that it is scriptural. It's an optional matter. We have examples in scripture of Paul being paid to preach. But you know what? We have examples in scripture of Paul being a tent maker, as we just mentioned there in Acts 18, and paying his own salary, so to speak, because of his secular job. Well, which one is right? They both are. They're both examples that we have the option to follow. So those are a few examples that, that show us sometimes we're given multiple ways in Scripture, and those are examples that we, they're optional. We have the option of following them. But let's look at some examples that we are obligated 
to follow. Notice this, first of all. Any approved example in the New Testament that is determined to be the only way that the teaching can be fulfilled is both authorized and binding. If it's determined to be, that's the only way you can fulfill that command. Anytime we talk about example, I, I think it goes without saying that we're talking about an example that is backed by an underlying command. And that gets back to our first point. There are examples that we ought not follow. Why? Well, because they're a violation of the commandments of God. But when you have a, a command that's backed by an, an approved, or, or an example, rather, that is backed by an underlying command, but you look and you go, you know, there's, I can't determine any other way that this could be carried out, then that's authorized and is binding. Now, last week we noticed sometimes we're given a specific command. God says, do this, don't do that. But sometimes he doesn't say exactly how to carry that out. For example, go preach the gospel to every creature. Well, do we go by plane? Do we go by train? Do we go by boat? Do we go on foot, automobile? All those are, are optional. And so we, we talked last week about expediency. Uh, a, a train or a car would be an expedient to carrying out the command to go teach the gospel or go preach the gospel to every creature. But when we are commanded and told how to do it, well, then that is not just acceptable, but binding. Genesis 6, remember God told Noah, you're going to build an ark. It's going to have a single window, a single door. He gives him the dimensions of the ark. He tells him the kind of wood, all these specifics. Well, not only does gopher wood then become acceptable for Noah to use, it becomes binding. He must use that in the construction of the ark. Jesus, had he just said in Matthew chapter 26, uh, y'all take the Lord's Supper and remember me. Well, that leaves a lot of things open, doesn't it? But he didn't just say that. He specified unleavened bread, fruit of the vine. Of course, he says, this, this is my body, this is my blood. And representative, of course, is the idea there. But he gives specifics. And so if we were to, you know, the old illustration has been used, Coke and ice cream or cake and ice cream or whatever you may be, really you can fill in the blank with any food that we were to put on the Lord's table and serve that, then that would be unauthorized because... Jesus was specific. So that's an example that we are obligated to follow. Acts 8, 35 through 40 is another good example where, again, Philip and the unit, they're on the road, they're studying, and, and let's just turn over there. And notice, as they come to this water, in verse 35, verse 35 specifically is the one that mentions Philip opened his mouth, <coughs> Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came into a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water. Well, you know, there's something to that. They're not... Uh, Philip doesn't say, get, grab a container and we'll go get some water and then we'll sprinkle it on you. He doesn't say, grab a container, we'll get some water and come up here and pour it on you. They go down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Well, you, somebody might say, but, but yeah, Chad, that's example. That's one of those examples that we have the option of following. You know, well, you could do it uh, by immersion, or you could do it by sprinkling, or you could do it by pouring. But when you study the New Testament, you see no other way that baptism can be carried out. In fact, it's the very definition of the word. We have a transliterated version of it, the, the Greek word, of course, being baptizo, meaning I baptize. It is just a, in fact, the noun version of it, baptism, is, is in the Greek, baptisma. So it's just a transliteration of that Greek word. But when you look up the definition of baptisma, it means to dip, to plunge, to immerse. It's by very definition. In fact, there are words in the Greek language. Had the Spirit wanted to give us an example of a sprinkling or of a pouring, there are specific Greek words for that. Specifically for sprinkling, I remember it's rontidzo. I can't remember the word for pouring. But there are words in the Greek that were available to be used if that were authorized. But the Greek is very specific in using a word that only means to immerse. 
And, of course, that fits right with the definition that we're given, Romans 6, 3, and 4. Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Buried. It's a burial. Well, again, that fits the definition. There's no other way, speaking in terms of the New Testament, that that command can be fulfilled except to be immersed fully in water. That's one of those examples that we are obligated to follow. Acts 14, let's go there while we're in the book of Acts. Acts 14, 21. Here's Paul and Barnabas, and they're preaching the gospel to that city. Uh, Derby, that is, verse, end of verse 20. And it taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed." They had elders, ordained them elders, in every church. Now, this might seem to be an optional matter, but it's not. We see in Acts 15, verse 2, in fact, you're right there. Let's just turn over and look at Acts 15, verse 2. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, these Judaizers, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Well, they had a question, so they want to go and speak to the elders. Paul, in Acts 20, verse 17, when he's getting ready to leave, who does he call for when he wants to instruct the congregation? He's calling for the elders there. Philippians 1.1 1, 1 mentions uh, Paul greeting the saints with the bishops or elders and the deacons. Titus 1.5, he tells Titus to appoint elders in every city. This might seem to be optional, but it's an example that we're obligated to follow. And I'm thankful to be in a congregation that has elders. We need to understand that it's not an optional matter this example in scriptures of elders. Now, there are times when a congregation just does not have men who are qualified. And believe me, a congregation is better off in working to get men who are qualified than appointing unqualified men. And too often that's happened where a congregation says, boy, we don't have elders. We got to have elders. And so they rush somebody into the eldership who's not ready nor qualified. That's a mistake. But I've also seen congregations where for whatever reason, the congregation is just content to rock along with no elders and say, well, you know, we'll just have men's meetings and they'll make the decisions and they'll decide everything. But folks, that's not God's plan. That's not God's way of doing it. You say, well, we don't have anybody qualified. What are you doing to get men qualified? Think about it, young folks and middle-aged folks here. We've got three elders, but the sad reality of life is those three elders aren't going to live forever. What are we doing to prepare ourselves for future service for the Lord? But God doesn't just say, well, here's an optional example in Scripture. God says, I want elders in every church. I want scripturally qualified elders in every church. But that's an example, one of those examples that we are obligated to follow. Acts 20, verses 6 through 8. You're probably still there in the book of Acts, so let's just, we can go over there and take a look at this. One of those we sections of the book of Acts, we, we sometimes call it we, W-E. It's the idea of Luke is traveling, Luke being the author of the book, Luke is traveling with Paul at this point because he uses that pronoun we. But he says, verse 6, we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, Passover, and came unto them to Troas in five days where we abode seven days. Why did they hang around for seven days? Well, you see in verse 7, Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. Well, somebody asks the question sometimes, well, why is the day binding but not the location? I mean, they're in an upper chamber. There are many lights there. Um, Paul preached till midnight. Uh, Y'all want to bind that one? <laughs> um, but you know, sometimes people will say, well, why do we pick the day and say, well, that's binding. It must be on the first day of the week, but we don't bind the other stuff there. Well, the reason is because in the rest of the New Testament, you'll see many places 
where the Lord's Supper is taken, Paul talks to the Corinthian brethren in chapter 11. He says, when you all come together into one place, it's not to take the Lord's Supper. Of course, he's rebuking them there because they're coming together into one place, but not for the purpose of communing together. They had turned it into a meal where some folks got plenty to eat and, and were borderline being gluttonous, and then others had nothing. But in the rest of the New Testament, we see many places, but there's always only the one day mentioned. Of course, the first day of the week is when Jesus rose from the dead, Mark 16, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 16, 2, Paul says there, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Sometimes the men who are up here uh, serving at the table on Sunday mornings will make the statement after the bread and the fruit of the vine have been served that this is not necessarily a, it's, it's not a part of the Lord's Supper, but it's a convenient time. Why? Well, we're gathered here together to partake of the Lord's Supper. We have men who have been uh, helping to facilitate the serving of the Lord's Supper, so it's a convenient time to go ahead and fulfill the command to lay by in store on the first day of each week is the idea there in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. Well, many locations in Scripture, but there's only one day that we ever read about, and that's the first day of the week. So that's an example that would fall into that category of an example that we are obligated to follow. Closing out our thoughts here, there are three different kinds of examples, as we've noticed. Sometimes God gives a direct command and says, here's what you need to do, or don't do this. But sometimes we have an example. And sometimes it's an example that God says, here's a, a cautionary tale. Learn from this mistake and don't follow it. And so there are examples, as we said, that we ought not follow. But then sometimes there are examples that we, we have an option of following. Well, a preacher may choose to preach for a congregation and be paid full time. I'm very blessed in that regard. And, and believe me when I say, I don't take it for granted. I appreciate the congregation here so much and the ability that I have to devote full time to spend with brethren, to study God's word, and to preach God's word, and I'm very thankful for that. A preacher may choose, and I've, I've known preachers who say, you know, I, I, I feel like I just want to be uh, self-supporting. Maybe it's a congregation that can't afford a full-time preacher. And so the preacher says, I'm going to uh, get a secular job, and I'll preach on the side. Well, that's an option. We have an example in Scripture of that with Paul in Acts 18, and that's an option. And then, of course, there are examples that we are obligated to follow. They're not just optional. They're not just authorized. They're binding. I love what Paul says in Philippians 4 and verse 9 to the brethren there at Philippi and to you and me as well. He says, those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Paul says, I've, I've set you an example. In fact, the, the well-known verse, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, where Paul says, be ye imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. He says, follow my example because I'm following Christ. You know, one example we have in Scripture is Jesus Christ. He came to this earth and he lived as a man. Peter says in 1 Peter 2, For even here and too were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Leaving us an example. And folks, this is obviously not an example that we ought not follow. It's not an example that is optional that we follow. It's an example that we are obligated to follow. Have you followed his example of submitting to the Father's authority? Because he submitted to the Father's authority, the Father gave him all authority in heaven and on earth. If you haven't done that, you need to give your life to him. You need to believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You need to repent and turn away from your sins, confess his name as Lord, and as we read about in Romans 6, 3, and 4, be buried in the watery grave of baptism. Have your sins washed away by the blood of the Lamb. When you do that, he will add you to his church. Acts chapter 2, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. You, you obey the gospel of Jesus Christ, he will add you to his church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, are we following the example that he left for us? Are we following that example? And if not, why not? Heaven's invitation is open. If you need to respond in any way, won't you make sure your life is right with God? Do it now while we stand and sing. Have you been to Jesus for the God? Are you washing the blood?
our closing song this morning will be number 61. Thankful for your presence here at our worship today. We invite you back anytime you can be here. We will have our evening worship at 6 p.m., Pew Packers at 540. Look forward to seeing you this evening. Number 61, verses 1 and 3, then we'll be dismissed with a prayer. If you've filled out an attendance card, pass it to the center aisle to be picked up as we sing. There's within my heart a melody. Dear God, as we depart this building, watch over us and guide us in our travels. Take us safely to our respective homes. But help us to remember this lesson today, to put it in our hearts and to practice the words that were given to us. Guide us always in your path. Help us to be examples to shine our light to many others, but help us in all of our endeavors. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>